were here last year, right? Because that's what I got the impression is that this is something that you guys come to a lot. So who was here last year? Can you raise your hands? Oh yeah, so that's pretty much everybody. That's cool. All right, so I, so this first part, I did my homework, because I'm, I'm a decent student, so I did my homework, and I know last year you guys talked about ACEs, when um, you had a fantastic speaker up here last year that talked about ACEs. And so I'm gonna just give you a little overview of ACEs, because it does play into our stress conversation, but we're not gonna spend a ton of time on it, because you guys probably already know a great deal about it at this point. So, there's my heaven joke. There. Um, so, when we're talking about trauma, this is the ACEs piece that you guys learned about last year. You know that there's big T and little t trauma. There's the big catastrophic events, and then there's the chronic cumulative um, complex trauma that's ongoing neglect and abuse <coughs> and that type of thing. So those are the, the two types of trauma. In, in the, the world that I've lived in, you know, working in um, hospitals and juvenile facilities and that type of thing, we often see this little t trauma. It's kind of an accumulation over time. But that's not necessarily what we're dealing with when we talk about adolescent stress in general, when we talk about communities. That's hopefully a fairly small group. So you guys talked a lot about ACEs last year, and she did a whole presentation. She talked about these 10 areas in, in the Kaiser Permanente study and how it's the largest public health study, 17,000 people. And it has its limitations, but it's a great talk. It's a great starting point when we, we want to talk about trauma. But ACEs isn't necessarily all trauma, right? Some of the things on here are stressful, but they're not necessarily traumatic for everybody, right? I think a fair amount of us have been through, either our parents got divorced or we've been divorced, and that's a very stressful, and it can be traumatic, but it's, a, it's mostly a very stressful event, right? Um, but another piece that I really want to point out is the substance abuse piece. It says substance abuse, and that's not the language we're using anymore. So the substance use piece. But substance use is very stressful in communities and on children and in, in families and that type of thing. And I want to kind of connect the dots with this average child that experiences this up here. But it also contributes to a lot of these other pieces on here, right? Law enforcement knows that because you're probably dealing with a lot of that stuff. When you go, when you respond to domestic violence calls, probably more often than not, someone's under the influence. True? Not true? True. Yeah, true. So, um, yeah, so there's a lot of pieces there. I don't want to spend a lot of time on ACEs. So, so that's kind of our, our overview. There are 10 categories. We also know that ACEs contributes to, um, to a whole bunch of really unpleasant things, including an increased, uh, increased substance use, right? So folks that have a high number of ACEs are often more likely to, uh, to have substance use themselves or substance use disorder themselves later in life. And the more, the more ACEs one has, the more risky that behavior becomes. And often you see people, um, the more ACEs they have, the more they start to see um, uh, intravenous drug use and, and pretty chronic um, substance use issues. Um, I'm working with an organization right now that's trying to correlate the ACEs score with what types of drugs people are using, because they're seeing a lot of people with, with eights and nines and tens on their, on their ACEs scores using a lot of cocaine right now. So I know we've been really focused on the opiate use to sort of the opiate crisis, but, but we're starting to see stimulants kind of come back in the picture and it depends on the communities. So anyway, so that's that. So we're gonna kind of leave ACEs behind. We're not gonna spend a ton, ton of time. So what I asked, and what Celeste asked, and what you all asked is, what are teens stressed about? And this is where I was gonna ask you guys. You guys are gonna do something on in a minute, right? The, the youth in the room. So what I did is I looked around and I asked questions and, um, and I asked Celeste to do, forgive my voice by the way, I just got over a cold. So I don't normally sound like a teenage boy going through puberty. <laughs> um, but today I do. So thank you. Um, so anyway, so I asked, um, I asked Celeste to do, to find out from the, the kids what the kids were saying or what the teens were saying they were stressed out about. And then I looked at what teens are stressed out about around the world and across the country. Interesting how the number one thing, and this list, by the way, this is US teens and all teens, but this was actually taken from a group of teens in Australia. But it matched up with what the teens in the US were saying, and strangely enough, it matched up with, the, with what the teens in Raymond were saying. Number one, number one stressor was school. And that's kind of a broad thing because there's a lot of things that happen in school. And so what I started kind of drilling down with, with my closest friends and people that I know that have adolescents at home 
is that there's a lot of things about school that stress kids out. So it's not just exams, and it's not just um, the pressure of getting good grades and all the rest of stuff. Some of it's you know, dealing with your friends. Some of it's whether you're getting invited to places with your friends. Some of it, there's all kinds of different stressors. And what happened, and what's different from when we were kids to when kid, to what's going on now, it's not that we didn't stress about those things when we were kids, way back in the Stone Age. We were, we only had to deal with it on kind of one level. Kids today have to deal with it on a multiple levels because of the amplification from technology. So they go to school and they have to deal with the stresses at school and then they come home and then they deal with all those stresses again at home. I'm like, way off, you can shake her, you can go. No, she's crazy. So it, it gets amplified for, for kids today. And you guys probably don't even know that, right? Like we, I had a list, I don't know about you guys. Like before, before technology, before smartphones and all the rest of stuff, we had a home phone, right? And I used to carry about a yellow paper with all my friends' phone numbers listed on you. Hold it up and you put it in your pocket. That's how you kept track of everybody. And if your brother had too many girlfriends and stayed on the phone too long, you never got phone calls because that's just the way that worked. And so then you had to worry about, does nobody like me or is it they just like him better or what? But now, like there's instant information about what's going on all the time, who likes you, who doesn't like you, who's giving you crap and who's not giving you crap. And, and it's just, and I want us as adults to kind of really think about that. We didn't have that kind of echo chamber, that kind of instant feedback all the time of what's going on all around you. So, so homework, um, homework in school, but there's also a lot of other parts of that. So I want you to all to know this too, that your Raymond teens, the second highest stressor, were your parent, were the parents. I'm just gonna say that out loud. <laughs> So as much as I love that you're all in this room, you also cause a fair amount of stress. <laughs> Notice that's not true, friend. No, I'm just kidding. Um, it's it is there's so number three on on the U.S. teams and all teams with social relationships, and that again that's true for your Raymond teens. That's true for um, that's true for teens all over the world, and we'll talk about that in a little while. I'm going to talk to you about kind of adolescent development, normal adolescent development in a minute, and how that kind of contributes to all of this stuff. So yeah, so that's that's what teens are, are stressed out about. And what I, from what I understand is the teens that are coming up after me are going to talk to you more about that. And I think that's wicked cool. And I love, love, love that we have teens in the room because so often we find ourselves spending time talking about what teens' needs are and we don't include it in the conversation. And fundamentally, that seems just bizarre. Like, you know, why would you talk about people and not have them present? Anyway. So I'm gonna spend a couple minutes talking about stress and toxic stress or chronic stress. So is stress good or is stress not good? Who says stress is good? Raise your hand. Is stress good? Who says stress is not good? Raise your hand. Not good. Okay. Well, that's interesting. It's, it's about a 50-50 split. Some of you are more stressed than others, I'm assuming. But, um, but yeah, so stress, Stress in and of itself is actually essential. Human beings would not have survived to this point if we didn't have a stress system in our body. Because the stress system is fundamentally, sorry, I'm walking around a lot, huh? Sorry, and I'm gonna keep doing that, so. Because um, so, that's stress, right? That's it. Um, yeah, so, so stress fundamentally, you have, everybody has a stress system in their body, by the way, in case you didn't know that, you all have one. So congratulations, well done. Um, but the stress system fundamentally its purpose is for what? Does anybody know what the stress system is for? Survival. <laughs> so if you didn't have one, you wouldn't be surviving. So stress is the body's way of preparing you to manage emotionally challenging, physically demanding, or life-threatening situations. So when we were like cavemen back in the you know, million years ago, whatever, and we had this stress system in place not to deal with 30-year mortgages or whether your best friend likes you, they had, we had stress systems to make sure that we could get away from the crazy tiger or the bear that was gonna eat us. That was the purpose of it. So your, the stress signals your body to release all the necessary hormones and align your systems to allow you to focus, increase your physical strength, increase stamina, and increase alertness. So that you can fight or flight, right? So you can get out of the way or you can beat up the bear. I don't advocate beating up bears, but if you have to, you have to. Stress can help you to complete tasks, increase, increase motivation, and accomplish difficult goals. 
Like I said, stress is wonderful for being able to stand up in front of 150 of your closest, dearest friends in New Hampshire, where I've never met before. <laughs> I've been in New Hampshire, just not here. <clears throat> the problem is, in, in the place where most people get really hung up, in the, most, in the place where most people talk about stress is not being helpful, is when we get into this place called toxic stress or chronic stress. Have you guys heard of this before? Yeah. And so our bodies were built, because um, I don't know if you've heard of Robert Sapolsky, or Sapolsky, I was his name. So Robert Sapolsky is a researcher um, from Stanford University in California who did this, he wrote this great book, and I love the title of it, called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. <laughs> Have you heard of this? So he spent 30 years in Africa studying baboons um, to, to look at their stresses and all, all kinds of things. But what he, the first thing he figured out by studying baboons is that, number one, he doesn't like baboons. <laughs> yeah, baboons are kind of jerky. They're not very nice to one another. But they're very similar to humans in that they, they can get all their food needs met in you know, a couple of hours. So they spend the rest of the day just aggravating the crap out of everybody else in the, in the baboon troop. <laughs> but, um, but what he says is that the stress, the stress system is meant for about three minutes of screaming terror which is followed either by you've been eaten by the bear or you're dead. I mean, you're dead or, or you've gotten away from the bear. So stress systems are meant to be turned on for a very short period of time and they move, they, they move all of your resources out to your limbs to make sure that you can fight or flight against the bear or the dragon or whatever. I like dragons, but, um, so we'll just go with dragons. So, um, but they're not meant to be turned on and left on indefinitely. And we live in a society now where we turn on our stress systems for all kinds of crazy stuff, including, as young people, what's going on in school, and exams, and making sure that you get enough playing time on the field, and global warming. Kids are really, really concerned about global warming right now. Did you know that? They're really scared about it, is what I'm hearing from folks. They're really concerned about, um, a lot of things that you are, are surprised, you'd be surprised that they're, they're concerned about. But we turn on these stress systems and we leave them turned on for long periods of time. And this is what we call toxic stress. And our body wasn't built for that. Our, our stress systems were not very specific in their approach. They were very generalized because they weren't, we didn't, you know, a million, two million years ago when we were developing as human beings, they didn't know anything about the internet yet. I know, call me crazy, they're old. but. They didn't know anything about 30-year mortgages, and they didn't know about traffic jams, and they didn't know about football teams, and whether you were gonna you know, get invited to, to you know, the, a party locally with all your friends. So toxic stress is, uh, through the release of the hormone cortisol, changes the brain. It shrinks the hippocampus, it, which is responsible for learning, memory, and emotional regulation. When you're stressed, is it easy to remember things? When you're super stressed, it's hard to remember things sometimes. Well, guess what? There's a reason why. Because this part of your brain over here, the hippocampus, not a hippopotamus, the hippocampus, is part of this limbic system down here, and that is responsible for this learning, memory, and emotional regulation piece. When you're super stressed, are you calm and rational? I'm not. I'm not calm and rational a lot of times, but I'm calm and rational most of the time. So, this part of the brain is being super affected by that. Also, the prefrontal cortex, which is this part up here, which is uh, responsible for executive function, like getting things done in, in, in a linear fashion and understanding consequences and that type of thing, that's also affected. Um, in the amygdala, the kids, when I talk about this, the kids refer to that as Queen Amidala, but it's <laughs> Star Wars. Um, thank you for laughing at that I think I'm gonna take this on the road. <laughs> So the amygdala would gets hyperreactive, and the amygdala is part. All these are part of what they call the limbic system of the brain, and the limbic system is responsible for your emotional response to the world. And so when you're um, when you're super stressed about things, your amygdala becomes more reactive, and it makes things just feel overwhelming sometimes, and you make sure your, your emotional system is just a little bit more sensitive. So that's stress. So. What's happening in the body? So this is my friend, Captain Underman. And he's gonna tell, he shows us a little bit about what's happening in your body. So we just talked about the brain. 
But you also have these other systems called, you also have this other system called the autonomic nervous system. Anybody ever heard that term before? It's a big term, yeah, one person. It's, it's you and me, it's you and me. So the autonomic nervous system is made up of two parts, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. There's three of us, because I see a nod over there. Um, so the, the sympathetic nervous system is responsible for our fight or flight response. This is the system that gets turned on when we're, in, when we're under stress or we, we believe that there's gonna be danger. Something's gonna be harmful to us. And that doesn't, again, our system is not very well designed to think about all the different things that might cause us stress. It's really just designed to go bear a dragon. Bear a dragon, get out of the way. Um, so when we think about the sympathetic nervous system, what we notice over here is that he, the first thing that we notice is that his eyes are very, his pupils are very dilated. Why on earth, if you're having a stress response, would your pupils be super dilated? What do you think that would be? Shout it out. So you can see, right? So that you can take in all the information in your environment and make decisions. And that happens in a split second. Very, very, very split second. But I, want, I often point this out to um, groups when I'm talking about substance use disorder too, because what's one of the things that we look at when we're looking to see if people are high? Whether their pupils are dilated. Sometimes they're in distress. It has nothing to, and we already learned that they're, a lot of their brain systems are offline and they're highly emotional when they're under a lot of stress. I just want to point that out. I'm not saying that that's not true what's happening, but I want to point out that these things are closely related sometimes. So the other pieces that are going on in the parasympathetic system are his heart's beating faster, his lungs are increasing oxygen intake, and his stomach contracts more slowly because he's just trying to get all of the, the blood flow and the, the muscles ready to, to be in place and ready to go if he, has, if he needs to fight or flight with the dragon. So um, anybody ever been super stressed and you just had a big meal and it doesn't do, it just sits like a rock in your stomach? Everybody have that experience at some point, just doesn't go, well, this might be why, because your systems are off. So what we want to do is we want to get people over to the other side. We want to get people <coughs> to the parasympathetic nervous system where rest and digest happens, right? That feels better, it's calmer. And it, that's what we want to help kids get to. So the rest of what we're going to talk today, talk about today, is talking, to, talking about stress systems and how, we're going to try to get kids and, and, and adults, quite frankly, over to the rest and digest system. 